Good morning and Happy New Year. We're glad to see you here this morning at Horizon. If you're able to stand with us, let's stand and sing to our Lord. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done. your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name king of heaven come we are Children of your mercy, rescued for your glory. We cry, Jesus, set our hearts toward you, and every eye would see you lifted high. King of heaven, come down. Of heaven come down let your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to say in your mighty name king of heaven come
continue this morning in worship, we're going to have an opportunity to share in communion at the end of this next song. So if you received your packets on the way in, take a moment during this song to open them up, and then we'll partake together at the end of it. Um, this song uh, speaks to the greatness of our God. It speaks to the majesty and the beauty of our God, and it says in the first verse, all the world rejoices. And we can rejoice in that majesty and that beauty. We can also rejoice that in our darkness, God's light shines into our darkness. And that's definitely worth rejoicing. Let's sing that together. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, it wraps itself in life, in darkness tries. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
night that Jesus was betrayed, after he blessed it, he broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And at the end of supper in the same manner, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood which was shed for you. Take and drink this in remembrance of me. Father God, we, uh, we thank you so much to be able to worship together to, uh, today, to be able to share communion together. And uh, we, we give such thanks for that amazing sacrifice that has saved every one of us. And that when darkness comes into our world, your light can shine into our world because it really isn't darkness. It's just the absence of light and your light shows us the way. And as we continue this morning and hear your word, let us feel that presence that we already know is here with us. And in Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Horizon. Um, I love that song, How Great Is Our God. And as we start a new year, Happy New Year, by the way. Um, thank goodness that is true. That in the ups and downs of life of 2020 through 2022, that God's goodness never changes and his greatness never changes. Um, well, today we are slated to start a new series called Numbers, out of the book of Numbers. Um, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, that Chad isn't able to join us today. Um, if you were here over Christmas, you might have heard that Chad had COVID. Um, thankfully, he's recovered from that. Um, but like many of us, his family has just been through the ringer. Um, so uh, a few days after starting to feel back to himself from COVID, um, Chad and Beth's son, Quinn, um, became very sick. So Quinn has uh, bacterial pneumonia in one of his lungs and has been in uh, the ICU at Children's Hospital um, really all week. Um, so definitely be praying for the Hovens. Um, so Chad won't be able to join us today, but um, what is a God moment in this is 10 months ago, Chad recorded uh, a message um, just in case COVID times, just in case he couldn't be here one week. Um, so that message is what we're going to listen to today. Um, but Chad actually sent an email that he, he wanted me to read. So it's kind of an intimate, personal um, sharing from Chad about what their family's been through this week um, that I think will set up the message really well. So it says this, it says, family and friends, it's been quite a week. Few things are more torturous than watching your child fight for their life. And few things are more helpless than hearing a confused child with autism repeat, help me, Dada, I want help time, over and over, 10 hours a day for six days. Quinn has some type of bacterial pneumonia from the strep family that blocked up his right lung. The doctor said it's not COVID, but it's just one of those illnesses that can happen. Beth and I have been trading off, rubbing his head and tickling his hands each day. We've prayed lots with and prayed lots for Quinn and appreciate all of you have done the same. A few days ago, a tube was inserted into his lung to remove the liquid outside of his lung. That has made a big difference whereby Quinn is no longer fighting for his life, but he still has a long road ahead fighting his way back to health. We are starting to see smiles and moments of relief and joy in him finally popping up throughout the day. So overall, his stats are moving in the right direction. As I share my message today that I recorded 10 months ago, little did I know that the subject of trusting God in the darkness would be so real to me now. Friends, God longs for us to find him and seek him even when we don't know where he is in our circumstances. And today we're going to study a psalm, Psalm 88. If you find yourself in the Psalms, it's just a great book to express emotion and lament sometimes to God, tears, sometimes joy. The Psalms can be a great place to remind yourself who God is and who you are and how to get real, risky, sometimes raw with your emotions with God. 
But Psalms 88, which we're going to look at today, is a particularly unusual one. And that even the lament psalms, the despondency psalms, the God, I need you now psalms, start with you in the pit. By the time it's done, they raise you out of the pit. Not so much with Psalms 88. Now I say that because I want to maybe apologize in advance. You got to stick with me. We're going to start in a pit pretty dark. And we're going to end in a pit pretty dark. However, there are some gems. There are some jewels. There are some truths in the pit in both this psalm as well as in life where you can find God in the midst of it. Let me start by reading the last verse of the psalm. Because it reminds me, my wife and I, when we were uh, first married, we had one of those five CD disc changers. And so it'd spin through randomly. And every once in a while, sure enough, would come Simon and Garfunkel's CD. We'd be sitting in the living room. We'd start hearing the voices, Hello, darkness, my old friend. That's almost the exact thing being said here in Hebrews. The only friend I feel like I have in this moment in time is darkness. Psalms 88, verse 18. Loved ones and friends, you, God, have put far from me, and my only acquaintance is darkness. Wow, Chad, sure, I'm glad I tuned in today. That was really encouraging. Well, again, stay with me because it gives a raw feeling to loneliness and despondency and feeling like God is out to get you or or left you or abandoned you. And yet he finds something and we discover something powerful in the midst of it. Now, here's the truth. You and I are never going to befriend darkness. We're never going to say, oh, I can't wait for more of those circumstances in my life. Wow, could I have another? Could I have another? Thank you, right? We're not going to say that. But though we may never befriend darkness, we all need a friend in the darkness. And we're going to find that God, and Jesus in particular, is the best friend you can find while you're walking through the darkness. So you and I may never befriend darkness, but we need a friend in the darkness. And to do that here, again, the last word in Hebrew literally is, and my only friend is, darkness. It's like the last word just haunts you at the end of the, of the chapter. Darkness. I want to show you three truths here embedded in, in Psalm 88 about darkness and, and what to meditate on while you're going through dark times so that you and I can know that we're not alone during those challenging times. So let's begin by looking at the first truth to meditate on during times of darkness. Well, the first one may seem a little discouraging, but I think it helps set our expectations for going through dark times. And what is that? Darkness can last longer than you think. Right? We wish darkness, when you go through dark times, hey, I'll give it a day, a week, certainly a month, but no, 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 not a year. We're not counting years here. Notice what happens as the psalmist begins to write these words. O oh Lord, God of my salvation. This sounds pretty good. I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you, God. Incline, lean into my cries for help. Lean your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. So what's he saying here? He's saying, I'm doing the right stuff. I'm crying out to you. I'm asking you to listen. And I'm in serious trouble. It looks like he's got some kind of death threat against him. He's facing the grave. And there are many times you will pour out your heart. You will give God your very best, the raw side of what's going on deep inside of you. And saying, God, help and when you have those sincere moments with God, and I've had those, where you're just like, you don't have any kind of formal prayer, you kind of slide into the bed, leaning next to the bed, God, I don't know what to do. You've got to be my deliverer. 
you've got to be my rescuer, right? And you think, boy, an honest prayer like that, a sincere prayer like that, surely God's going to fix this today, tomorrow, by this weekend. But as the psalm continues, we find that things aren't getting better. There isn't a quick fix here. The darkness lasts much, much, much longer than he thinks. And look at the words he uses. I've been crying out day and night before you. This has been going on for a while. Let my prayer come up to you because it doesn't seem like it is. It feels like the prayer is bouncing off the ceiling and ba- bang, bang, boom. God, I got to punch through and get your attention. Would you incline or lean your ear toward me? My soul is full of trouble. The darkness, it's not just out there. It's starting to come in here. My soul is starting to get depressed and overwhelmed. And I don't know if I can trust you. My life, the stakes are serious here. It's drawing near the grave. That could be actual physical danger or just the maybe thoughts of suicide because of the sorrowful heart. Whatever is going on here, clearly the darkness has lasted longer than he thinks. Now, why is this important? I think for many of us, we come to God and we actually think quick fix time. And yet God will use darkness in our life to grow us, to turn us into people of greatness, to, to more deeply understand him as the light when you go through darkness. But if we come to God with an expectation, you're definitely going to fix this if you are really a good God within the next few minutes, moments, or months, we may be setting ourselves up for some real false false expectation that lead to despair. So before you go through challenging times, remind yourself darkness might last longer than you think. However, that doesn't mean that darkness is meaningless. How do I know that? Because we know who wrote this psalm. His name was Heman. Heman. Now who's Heman? Heman was a musician. He was the grandson of Samuel. From the book of Samuel. And he was a chief musician for King David. His family was very, very well known. He was a, a top 40 songwriter. He was a great artist. So whatever he's going through, keep in mind, this is a well-known family. This is a very talented musician. And this is someone who has a whole family legacy going back to the prophet Samuel. Now, he played a couple instruments. One of the instruments Heman played was the cymbals. And he found ways to, you know, big things for God, big musical moments. Look what God's about. Praise the Lord. But he also played cymbals that archaeologists have found during that time that are very small. Look at these. So be on your fingertips. Cling, 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 cling. Sometimes when you're used to God doing big things, you know, really sometimes it's in the darkness. We just barely hear God's voice. Keep going. I am with you. Keep going. I will help you. Heman also played the trumpet. You think trumpet, don't think. I think the shofar. So he would announce battle, announce that God is with us. God is going to give victory. Just like he took down the the walls of Jericho, God will take down your walls. There's a couple different types of trumpets. One of them is a shofar, and there's a a smaller version of it that might be played. So Heman was used to big things happening, big things that God was doing. But it was during this time of darkness, he felt like things were meaningless. God had abandoned him. And yet God is going to use this time of darkness to form him to become a great artist who knows how to trust God at the mountaintops with the trumpet and in the valleys. So he writes many, many, many psalms that we find in the book of Psalms. Several of them are in Psalms 40s and some are in the 80s. This is where we find the writings of a man who wrote songs that led people into worship of God at the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And he would never have imagined that this psalm we're reading would be studied 2,000, 3,000 years later by people in America or London or all over the world, right? 
What feels meaningless is God said, I want to take you through some dark times to form you into a great artist that teaches people how to find me in the darkness even when it lasts longer than you might think. Now often, as a pastor, we get a chance to walk with people through some of the darkest times in their life. In fact, I just had one this week. We had a funeral at the church. 400, 500 people showed up to mourn together. And to mourn together at a family in our church who lost a son in his early 20s. I tell you, there is nothing more difficult than sitting with a family in what seems like meaningless suffering and loss of life way too soon. Often when I stand up at the podium and I'm looking out at so many faces wondering what Heman's wondering in our passage. Where's the meaning in this? Where's the purpose in this? How can there be a good God if this is happening? And to look into the eyes of a mother with tears rolling down her cheeks and a father just grimaced in pain. You say, where is God and how could he have allowed this to happen? Have you ever been there? I don't know if you're there now. If you remember time you have been there or time you will be there. I was talking to a friend recently at our church who lost her son before he was even 10 years old. I said, how are you and God doing after that? She said, you know, in one sense, I don't think that my relationship with God will ever be the same because he took my son from me. She said, the other day I found this little monkey that my son used to play with. I took the monkey and I kind of tucked him in sitting on the shelf right above the fireplace. It's been a couple of years since my son had passed away and I just felt all the emotion come back over me. I thought, no, there's a place of darkness. She said, but I'll tell you this. Even though my relationship with God has been fundamentally changed since that moment, it's not all bad either. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I began to realize that when Jesus dies on the cross, the God I serve knows what it's like to lose a son. He watched his son, who was taken in an unjust way, who was taken long before he should have died in the sense of he, he should have lived for a longer lifespan. And I realize that the God I serve, though I don't understand it and though I don't like it, and though I'm still kind of ticked off about it, I have a God who can identify with me and meet with me. He understands the kind of feelings and darkness I feel. So my relationship with God has changed. It's different than I expected. But I also realize God is with me in the darkness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of doubt, he is with me. So number one, darkness can last longer than you think. But there's a second truth to meditate on. What's that? Was that darkness gets darker when you lose the light. All right? And darkness is the best place to learn about, even to love the light. And that's exactly what Heman finds out. When he begins to get in despair and think that God's against him, he's got already the bad circumstances, and now, because he's lost the light, the darkness gets darker. Because I don't even know if God is with me or God is for me. However, like I mentioned already, darkness can be the best place to learn to love the light. Sometimes you don't realize that God is everything you need until you realize he's the only thing you have. And you love his comfort. You love his presence. You reach into that kind of bucket of attributes he has and just say, God, I love you because I need you so desperately. So darkness gets darker when you lose the light. But darkness is the best place to learn about the light. 
Now, how does Heman discover that in the passage? Look what it says. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. Man, I'm in the darkness. I'm like a man who has no strength. It's been zapped out of me. I'm adrift among the dead. Like the slain who lie in the grave. Just picture him in a, in a cemetery looking at all the graves and like, wow, that's how I feel. Whom you remember no more. And see how the darkness just got darker? It's bad enough that I'm in the pit. Bad enough I have no strength. Bad enough that I feel cer- certain ways like I'm among the dead. But I feel like you remember no more. Wow, things got real dark. Wow, things got real meaningless. Because God's not even remembering me. I'm like those who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me. And no, look, now it gets personal. You've done this to me, God. You've laid me in the circumstance. You've abandoned me here. You have laid me in the lowest pit in darkness, in the depths. Do you feel the darkness getting darker? It's gone from I got bad circumstances to you, God, have been out to get me. This is personal. You're attacking me. This is permanent. This is pervasive. It's affecting every area of my life. And you don't even care. Can you just feel the darkness getting darker? Because it feels personal. Because it feels permanent. Because it's pervasive. It affects everything. And because it feels like God isn't with me. And yet... It's in times of darkness we discover how powerful the light can be. Look what he says. Still going to get darker before it gets better here. Your, your wrath, oh my goodness, you're punishing me. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You have afflicted me with all your wave after wave after wave of despair. You have put away my acquaintances. You pushed away my friends, pushed away the resources I need far from me. You have made me, look at the you, 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 you. You have made me an abomination to them. My friends don't come around. They don't ask how I'm doing. They're like, well, what's going on with him? But God's clearly punishing that guy. I am shut up and I cannot get out. So again, the darkness just got even darker. You can imagine if you're in a, you ever been in a cave, a dark place where you can't even see your hand? That's how his life is feeling right now. Look what he says next. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I've called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Now notice, remember I told you darkness is the best place to learn about the light? It's in times of despair that we pray real prayers. Not religious prayers, not like, you know, kind of appropriate prayers, raw prayers to God. I am daily calling out upon you. I'm stretching out my hands to you. God, I need help. It's in moments of, of darkness that you're like, I, God, I'll even take a glimmer of light. I'll take a spark. I'll take a match. Just anything, God, to know you're with me. That sense of desperation for God develops in you a dependence on God that you cannot find in any other circumstance. Like, well, I don't really want it. I know. But once you feel it, once you have it, you're like, you know what? I wouldn't have sought this out. But now that I know what it's like to really, truly depend on God, I couldn't have gotten this any other way. It's exactly what Heman found in the darkness. Are right, you ever been caving? We used to go caving as a kid. And there are times you can see the light, but the darker you go into the cave, it gets to the place you can't see anything. That gets so dangerous. We were walking along a cave one time. We didn't see a, a hole in front of us. My dad was having us go very, very slow. And all of a sudden, he took the torch in our hand and, and set it down the ground. He's like, look, two or three foot pit or hole and it dropped down two or three stories. Had my dad not been there to show it to me, 
I would have dropped straight down into a, a cavern. But it's in the, the darkness, it's in the caves of life. Oh my goodness, one little match. My dad would like one little match, you'd be like, your everything was drawn to it because it was pitch black darkness. God is like that candle, that match, or that light. And God wants you in the midst of your darkness to reach out to him. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need your hope. God, I need your comfort. The darkness, the caves, is the best place to learn about the light and to understand who God really is and what he wants for you and what he wants for me. We may not like the darkness. We don't, we don't ever befriend the darkness. But we can find a friend in the darkness. I had a phone call a few weeks ago. I was talking to a friend who had lost her father. And she said, God was just so gracious to me when my father passed away. I said, well, tell me about that. She said, you know, I've seen several people die, and, you know, when you die, it's not always like the movies where it's peaceful. In fact, that's why the Bible says that death is the final enemy. Your body is actually fighting to stay alive because our body was never designed for death. So death can be a pretty horrible thing to witness. She said, but God was so gracious in what I got to see with my, with my, with my grandfather. So tell me about that. She said, well, the family gathered together in hospice. And we left for the day. And we got a call from the hospice nurse saying, I don't know if he's going to make it. This might be his last night. So we turned back around, gathered around, called a few people from across town. And my dad almost knew this was the final hours. It was like he was holding on till we were all there. It was such a gift. We all arrived and gathered around the bed. And we got a chance to say to Dad, Dad, we love you. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Some were thanking Dad, some were thanking Grandfather. It was just that family moment of everyone expressing their love for this great man. And then we sang together some hymns. And again, we just invited God's light in the midst of our tears, in the midst of our moments. We could just feel God's presence. Then somebody said, let's read, uh, let's read a verse from the Bible. So somebody picked up the Bible, and they read from Psalm 23. And as they were reading those words, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. So it was in those moments, holding hands with my grandfather, that he quietly passed into heaven. And she said it was a moment of sorrow, it was a moment of darkness. But wow, did we feel God with us. A God, a man that, that Isaiah describes as, Jesus was a man acquainted with, with grief, acquainted with sorrow. He's a wonderful counselor. And though no one wants to lose your father, no one wants to lose your grandfather, there's something okay about being angry, even frustrated, even, even screaming at, as Jesus did several times, the power of death. But Jesus knows what it's like. He's the God who left heaven to come to earth to know what it's like to be betrayed, to lose his cousin beheaded by Herod. He is a high priest who truly can sympathize and empathize with us in sorrow. What my friend Holly found that day is one of the Psalms came to life. What do I mean? When you reach out and find God in the darkness, the darkness doesn't get darker and thicker. You find the light, even a glimmer of it, brings you hope because God is with you. What does Heman say next? What's the last thing we need to meditate on? Well, it's that we don't want to feel alone. We don't want to feel like our, our, our suffering is meaningless. What you and I really want, we long for a friend in the darkness. You ever talk to somebody and they've been through cancer and they know what it's like to face 
ongoing chemo treatments, right? And you try to relate. You say, well, I've got some friends who've been that. And, and you know, you're trying. But you ever seen two cancer survivors meet each other? <laughs> there is a bond. There's like, you get it. I have found a friend who knows what it's like to walk through this valley. How about the military? You can come into the military and have all kinds of different political views, all kinds of different backgrounds. But you come in and you face war together, it creates a bond. You've, you've got a friend in the trenches. And those are lifelong friends. Not that you wanted to get in that foxhole. Not that you wanted to be in those circumstances. But in those circumstances, you know what it's like to have a real friend who gets it. In your heart and mind is that longing. We long for a friend who gets it. Who gets what darkness is really like. And that's exactly what he finds here. and What we find in the scriptures. Here's what he says. Again, he's still pretty ticked off. In fact, I told you, he starts in the darkness, he ends in the darkness, right? This isn't taking this up. He's longing while accusing God. He's longing for a friend in the midst of the darkness. Will you work wonders for the dead? Are you going to wait till I'm dead to do something? Shall the dead arise and praise you? It'll be too late then, God. Dead people don't praise you. Selah, which means to pause. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave? Look at the emphasis. He's convinced he's going to die. Grave, dead, praise. And by the time I die, there's no hope. Which makes sense. Or your faithfulness in the place of destruction, shall your wonders be known in the dark? And your righteousness in the land of the forgetful? Now keep in mind, he's looking for a friend in the darkness. And the darkness of facing death. And he's saying, after you die, there is no hope. But to you I've cried out. I've told you this. Oh God, in the morning my prayer comes before you. Every morning I'm still praying. Every morning I'm still talking to you. Every morning I'm saying I need help. Oh Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? Hide your face from me. Make a note of that. I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors, just the terror of every day it's going to come back. I'm distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. You ever been in a circumstance like that? You feel like no one gets it. No one's ever been there. I am alone. God doesn't understand. Friends don't understand. And this doesn't feel like subjective. I feel this is bad. It feels objective. This is true. But do you notice any of those phrases? While he's accusing God of things, we know this side of the cross that God is not watching from a distance. God encountered everything he talked about here, didn't he? You know what it means to ultimately be cast off by God? You know the person who ultimately endured the actual face of God turning away from him? You know who actually faced the grave and the death and was left to his own? Jesus. Right? In fact, the fierce wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross. He was abandoned to the grave. He was left. He was cut off. He didn't have the, the face of God with him and had to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, in his darkest hour, Jesus answers these questions. The dead can praise him, for he overcame death. He allowed himself to be abandoned by God, where God's face was turned away from him, so that... God's face would never turn away from you and I. See, Jesus went through the ultimate darkness. Our darkness, as real as it feels, as dark as it is, is nothing compared to the eternal darkness Jesus faced of all the darkness of every single person and God's wrath against every single sin poured out on every person in human history. 
And he endured that. And he says to you and I, you're, you're a cancer survivor. I'm a cancer survivor. You're a darkness survivor. I know your darkness and something far worse. And I endured it for you so I could be a friend to you in darkness. Your strength, your forgiver, your wisdom, your comforter. He was cast off. He had God's face hidden from him. He faced the ultimate terror on the cross and the grave. And he felt and took on God's fierce wrath. So what do we do? What's the response to a psalm like this? Well, if you were the editor of the Bible, wouldn't you be like, hey, let's take this one out of here. It's kind of depressing, kind of discouraging. What this psalm says, and the fact that God left this in the Bible, put this in the Bible, is God knows what it's like when people talk in despair. And he put this in here because here's what's important to realize. And I think it's the key takeaway we need to understand. What did he do right? He kept talking to God. He's ticked. He's in despair. He's angry. He's fearful. But what does he keep doing? He keeps talking to God in the darkness. Right? Remember, keep talking to God when you're going through dark times. That's why God included this in the Bible. What he did right As he kept saying, I don't get it, I don't understand it, and I don't like it. But I'm still talking to you every morning. See, it's easy when the darkness gets darker to think God's against you. So you don't talk to him anymore. But God would rather have us wrestle with him. Because when you wrestle with somebody, you're at least close to them. God's like, wrestle with me. Pound your fists on my chest. Let's interact. Let's wrestle over this. Keep talking to me. Remember how the psalm ends? You have cast off my friends from me. You've cast off my acquaintance from me. And my only friend is darkness. But through this whole thing, God's like, no. You keep talking to me. I am your friend in darkness. And it may last longer than you think, but I'm with you. And I am with you, so don't forget during times of darkness to keep reaching out, keep calling out, keep wrestling. Think of the book of Job. The book of Job, horrible things happen. Bam, 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 terrible things. By the end of the book, and Job has said some pretty harsh things to God and about God. And God says to Job's friends, hey, Job handled this the right way. And you're like, what? I read these things like this psalm. It's like, wow, these are some harsh things. You can't say that to God. You can if God's a God of grace. See, if the Bible's about religion, religious people can't ever say this kind of stuff to God because God get mad. So one option is get mad at God and just throw him out, right? I'm an atheist. I don't need God. On the other hand is I'm religious and I have to only pray appropriately. In the grace of Jesus, you can wrestle with God, beat on God's chest, because you know he's your God, even if you don't get what he's doing. I've had moments in my life, just so many, I couldn't even count. Moments when I just flopped over on my knees on the side of my bed. I said, God, I don't know what to do. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And after weeks or months of praying, you know what? I still had no idea what to do. I did not get wisdom. Though I sought it. But I tell you what I did get. A bittersweet, bitter because I didn't want to go through the circumstances. A bittersweet understanding of what it really means to depend on God For daily bread. God, I need you to make it one more day. And God wants that gift for you more than anything.
that you would know what it's like to have that men of war kind of relationship with God, that you know you've been in the trenches and he's been in the trenches with you. There is something warrior-esque, there is something empowering, and there is something sweet about knowing God in the darkness. So can I pray for you that you would meet God? You don't have to befriend the darkness, but you would find the friend of the darkness in your current circumstances. Let's pray together. Can I pray for you? Maybe you just want to call it to God. God, I'm sorry I stopped talking to you. I'm sorry I gave up asking and struggling. God, I've just been overwhelmed by the darkness. But God, I want to find you as the friend of darkness. Forgive me for my accusations. Forgive me for thinking I know better than you. And Father, I invite you in to my valleys. I invite you into my challenges. God, that you would guide me. And if you, and if you can't fix this thing, Father, remind me that you are with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is with you. He is the light in whatever darkness you face. I don't know about you, I've experienced a lot of God moments in my lifetime. This sure feels like one that Chad recorded that message 10 months ago. And it's speaking so much into what is going on in his family's life right now. And speaking to me, we all know people that are sick right now. As we were praying this morning together as a team, I think Ryan said we probably each know at least a dozen people that are sick. And that light that shines in and that message just is so powerful. And what we need to do is, is put Jesus back in the center. The other God moment for me right now is that we plan to do the song that we haven't done in years right now. And it's, it's what we need to put Jesus in the center, to let him put the light on our path, to let him put the wind back in our sails. So if you would like to stand with us one more time, let's sing this uh, worship tune. Jesus.
in the ocean. Uh, we just thank you that you are the center, that you are the rock, you are the anchor um, that we can hold on to, that you never change. And I pray that that would be where we find our hope, um, that we find it in you. So we thank you in your name. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here this week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week.